Hey, welcome to the Drip and Stone podcast, the podcast where two friends and sometimes three friends raise a glass and have a conversation. I'm Nick. I'm Kyle. I'm Dahi. Hey, 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 by the way. (laughs) Related happy birthday. Hey, uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Big 4 0. <laughs> nice. Yeah, thank you, sir. Cool. Well, good. Well done. Yeah, it was... reaching a big milestone. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well done. You didn't die for forty years. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, like, amazing. You know, if it was you know eighteen thirty, you'd probably be <laughs> right already dead. Yeah, be the town elder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the wagon wheel didn't kill you. A horse with a bump chair. Right. Someone would have shot you. Or you got the cold. Would have got you. Yeah, just had the flu. Took you out. <laughs> Common cold got me. <laughs> Not again. So well done. All right. So here's what we're thinking, Dahi. You guys sent us a lot of awesome stuff. There's a lot of awesome stuff. Yeah. And thank you. And thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. So what we're thinking, let's reacclimate with the regular tenure, the grain real quick, just to... And that's what I'm going to start with too, actually. There you go. See? I like it. So, uh, I'll pop a cork. Yeah, go ahead. Shall I? I got a tenure grain over ice, like my, my, my serve. Love it. Hey, actually, so I took your advice and um, I went out and I got some of the San Pellegrino, the Lemonada. Oh, sure. And uh, I threw the Bill Phil in that. That is fantastic. It's so good, it's isn't it? It's so good. And, and you're right. Like, I walked into the kitchen and my wife's like, what are you drinking? And I'm like, lemonade. She's like, bullshit. <laughs> I'm like, no, seriously. So I, I showed her the can. She's like, doesn't smell like lemonade. I'm like, I promise. It's lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> so then she tried definitely it. lemonade. I'm just avoiding giving you any additional information. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm not being I'm not being transparent with you. I'm like most sources. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> All right. So let's reacclimate with the the W D O'Connell, the single grain. It's a single grain Irish whiskey. Uh, and it comes yep. in at 10 years. And this is correct me if I'm wrong, Dahi, this is a bourbon and rye cask blend is that correct uh, vatting yeah that, so okay. it's, obviously yeah or blend you can use blend we say vatting or marrying because it just it it doesn't confuse people in thinking it's a blended whiskey right guess, okay you know what i mean theoretically you are blending them there are different barrel types so there's a 10 year old and a 12 year old and then the 12 year old is kept in 12 year old grant and cooley is kept in rye ex-american rye whiskey barrels and then the 10 year old is kept in ex-bourbon from cooley as well hence it's still a single grain and then i take a small percentage of the 12 and I marry it then in a blending tank or a vatting tank two to 10. So it's not a, it's not a finish if you know what I mean. Right. right. 48%. Yeah. 90, 96, 96 proof. 96. It's a good, it's a good proof level. I know you guys like 100, 185 proof stuff and things like that. <laughs> when we can find it. <laughs> it's good breakfast whiskey though. You know? that's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, I don't think I've had this since that episode. No. Since we sat last and it has such a strong vanilla mm-hmm. characteristic right on the front. Man, so delightful. Oh, it truly is. What really sticks out to me, you, you get those quintessential Irish whiskey notes that are there, but then there's this added layer of a little bit of spice. And I'm assuming sure. it's from the rye, the rye barrels. Yeah. And there's this really nice back-end vanilla sweetness, which I'm assuming is from the bourbon barrels. So it's, it's this like... Nice combination of all three of them together. Yeah, it's totally. Irish whiskey, quintessential, you know, that short bready notes that you kind of get from Irish whiskey. And then a little pop here and a little pop here. I go on the record. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I dare <laughs> I really you to do. find something negative to say about it. I really would. Um, well, if you do find something negative to say, keep it to yourself. Yeah. 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 <laughs> keep that one in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> no need to bring um, it up. <laughs> yeah, it's the it's it's a it's the, it's the grain whiskey though. Yeah. Like obviously the malt or a pot still are not going to give you those no, those flavor profiles you're thinking about there. Right. That's you're getting them from grain and you're getting them probably from you because you're probably I'm assuming used to drinking blends. Fully Jameson, yeah, uh, yeah, and I think and they're like, predominantly grain whiskey. Exactly, so, and I, I yeah. think especially here in the states, you know, that's. Not that we can't get pot still and, and, a, and a bunch of different things, but I would say absolutely. You know, Jameson, Bushmills, that they are the the most readily available, which I'm I'm assuming is also the same in in Ireland itself. Yeah, well, like in Ireland, like you can get a huge selection of whiskey uh, from Ireland, obviously. Um, uh, yeah. But it is I, like my I was in Boston since we last spoke, and my first time visit Massachusetts, and the selection was quite impressive in a lot of shops. Like like I remember. 
seeing pictures on you know on facebook groups and things like that where like you had you know four rows and now you got you know four whole sections yeah and you got maybe like you know 30 rows of yeah. whiskey and you got a good there's a long way to go but like compared to scotch or bourbon obviously but it's a big improvement in a short, quite a short time frame, really, when you think about it. So I'd even say you just need to keep pushing through, though. You know, you need to keep momentum going and not let that kind of don't get complacent and don't let it just think, oh, you're there and you've made it as a category because you haven't. If you come to Ireland and see, you know, if you look at the category in Ireland and you see what's available, and most of it is not in the US. Like most of my stuff never meets the US, and I'm only in a fraction of tiny fraction of states in the US. And I'm like most small producers, you're in a handful of areas. And in, in those areas, you're in a handful of little pockets, even because you're in specialty stores, liquor stores or something. You're not in the in the in the big ones because you're probably not playing at that price point either, you know. Right. I mean, I would say I'm I'm assuming you too, like within the last two to three years, we've seen a lot more Irish whiskey in the market because Dahi, you're right. I mean, before it was like you know, you have your your two big names and then like a couple of things here and there, but they were all honestly produced by Jameson in some fashion. Right. Um, and or owned by, you know, subsidiaries and that kind of thing. But now here you're starting to see a lot of variability, which is nice. Yeah. I mean, most stores here, it Irish used to not even have its own like category or mm-hmm. its own like area it's in like the whiskey. store. It was like just kind of like attached to scotch on one side or the other. Where now it's like, yeah, they have the entire section now. Yeah, and and you know what I'd love phenomenal. to see happen, and it's not going to happen. Is I'd love for that to disappear, and I'd love for whiskey, I'd love for liquor stores to move to flavor profiles. Yes, absolutely, and not countries because countries don't matter, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, states don't matter, whatever. It's it's flavor profiles. You put the bill fill there beside that ten, there are nothing similar. No. They're from the same country, that's about it. There's nothing similar about them. Right. Yep. That te- that bill fill is more in common with any number of peated whiskeys from Scotland right. than it does a bottle of Jameson. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. It's they're they're nowhere near each other. And we've actually I've actually suggested that to a few store owners. And most of the time, you know, you get a slap in the head and get told to <laughs> mind your own business. Uh you but you, a you couple make the of whiskey. people have taken us up in that offer and yeah. one in particular in Belgium and they have changed their whole store on my suggestion oh. to flavor profiles. And now Bill Phil is one of their top three selling whiskeys because they don't forget about it. It's not on the bottom shelf beside a bottle of Jemison. It's up beside Kilcoman right. and Big Pete and Pete Monster and Compass Box and right. uh, Wee Beastie and all these things. And that's brilliant. Yeah. And that's what it should be as yeah. a flavor, as a style of whiskey. It's single malt that has a flavor. So like, you know, one store at a time. But <laughs> <laughs> that provides way more information to the consumer. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've seen wine stores will do that and fairly readily in terms of they might organize by red, white, you know, rosé, that category kind of thing, type. category types. But I've seen a lot of wine stores, at least in this area, they'll do, okay, yes, this is a red wine aisle, but here's the flavor profile of these red wines. As right. you go from left to right down the aisle, if you're looking at it, you know, you've got big, bold red wines. So you might have some Ar- Argentinian and some, you know, all these Malbecs and those kind of things. And then slowly you'll go to, you know, more desserty red wines and light and fruity. Right. Yeah. And that's the way it should be, like, really, because that gives you the consumer, but like, a, an origin sorry that's me pontificating about about how i need the industry to change so my life will be made easier <laughs> <laughs> but i don't think it's just that i mean i think you're right that ultimately that kind of thing in my mind anyway makes it easier for consumers to find new things you know i like this kind of whiskey and this other whiskey that maybe doesn't have a, a prominent place on a marketing shelf is very similar because it's in this section. Let me try a peated Irish whiskey because it's in this peated section. And I like peat. Yeah, kind of especially thing. to the novice, you know, whiskey drinker that, oh, okay, so all Islas must taste smoky and and harsh. So I don't really like Isla. Well, no, that's not that's not really true. I mean, there there are certainly some milestone whiskeys that come from Isla that are smoky and harsh, but they're they're not all that way. Right. So it, it would be way more intuitive, I think, to separate them that way. Yeah, I, I think it's just lazy to do it. The yeah, other way. for sure. Well, and I, I wonder, as so many things are, I'm sure it's all related to 
money and we'll give you this much money for this much prominence on the shelf and so on and so forth. Or just, that's eh, going to be too much work. Yeah. I don't uh, want to move shit around. Yeah, that's I way too hard. That. It's already set. <laughs> those, yeah. That's those bottles have been on the shelf for like what? 20 years. Uh huh. You might want to move them. Nah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Nah. Let them collect dust. They're good there. <laughs> So, Dahi, before we move on to a, a couple of things that you've provided us here, uh, the last time we spoke with you was mid-October. I think that episode came out first of November, early November. Um, what have you been up to? Oh, what have I been up to? I've been <laughs> summarized the, the last seven months. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. I can barely remember last week. Uh, so this week I saw Bruce Springsteen and I had a whiskey tasting. My I did my first ever whiskey tasting in Dublin. My first what? ever. <laughs> that doesn't sound accurate. I know. I know. Uh, in the Palace Bar in Dublin, it's on Fleet Street. It's an institution of pubs in Ireland. It's uh, if you ever come to to Ireland, you have to go there. Well, funny that you mentioned that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be there in late June and. Ah, early well, July. Yeah, we're gonna have to go for a beer. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I'll be in. Uh, I'll be in Dublin, and then we were looking at heading towards County Cork, kind of down your way. Um, yeah, you pass by me. Yeah, ah, there we go. And uh, also out to we'll probably do the Ring of Kerry, um, heading that further further west. So yeah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, well, we, let's we'll hook up and we'll arrange some times to meet maybe in dublin i could if you want a bit of a tour guide i can i can, if you want to know, if you want to find out all the best pubs i'll bring you <laughs> <laughs> we know a guy. it's work i gotta I'll, I'll, my, my miss i gotta go to work it's, uh, it's a write-off it's, yeah. it's, it's a, marketing it's a write-off um, who's gonna write it off and then yeah so if i go back a bit further than that I, yeah. I i've been to boston we launched in massachusetts um recently i've been at a few whiskey shows in europe we have, we have a few bottlings coming out as a result of those. And at Christmas, we released five single casks. Oh, <laughs> wow. So, Holy moly. Yeah, yeah. We were playing catch up. We had done we had done nothing for the first eight months of the year um, because we were trying to make sure everything was and the cash flow was all tied up in the in the production facility. I wanted to just get that done. And then it was like, right now we got to get some cash back in. Yeah, because so if I remember, they right. were all supposed to be kind of dropped one month at a time, and they ended up being dropped, you know, two weeks apart. Because <laughs> you're you're doing the the cask share program, right? So that's like, uh, and people can buy into a single cask, and then they get bottles from that cask, correct? Yeah, yeah. We we bottled our first one of those in June. Yeah, right. and then we bottled the remainder of one of those casks into a twenty year old rum. You have it there, I think. Mm -hmm. So that was the remainder of the cask share cask we had left. So we had we had a hundred bottles left out of that and um yeah it was kind of a hectic time uh, yeah yeah a lot of shows then from january like the first whiskey show started in january on the 18th of january and then it's been like constant travel you know every second week i did a two-week stint where i went to provine in dusseldorf from there i got a train to eindhoven and did five uh, crossed the border into belgium and did five days in belgium and did three whiskey shows and uh, 15 tastings and then Went up to the Netherlands and the, the next morning on a Saturday and did two days at a whiskey festival there and then hopped on a plane to Massachusetts and did three days there in Massachusetts going around. So it was, and then back home. So that was, <laughs> that sounds, sounds busy, but sounds fantastic. I was going to say like, that sounds both amazing and terrible. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, yeah. I, I was so tired. I was not doing that again. <laughs> You're trying to be really efficient with your time, and all you're doing is like killing yourself slowly. <laughs> yeah, man, you're going to be 44 this year. You got to slow down. <laughs> um, but it, it, you know, it's it's great. It's good. It's good to be busy, and I get to. We're going to be doing lots of bottling now for the summer. And preparing our, we're preparing a lot of stuff for a few single casts coming out now with some people. We got a whiskey bottling, a festival bottling, our first festival bottling in Netherlands in a festival called Whiskey in Leiden. It's near Amsterdam. And that's in June, and then we're we have a local bottling here for a off license a friend a guy that used to we used to work together twenty five years ago actually, and he sells my whiskey now and he has his own bottle shop, so we're good pals since. Um, so that's kind of cool. I'm doing a single cast bottling on our first age statement, Bill Phil, Ooh. in Sicilian an ex Sicilian Marsala wine cask. Ooh. Um, so it's a smoky Sicilian. Uh, nice. That's my nickname in college. I didn't. I, I wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask why. I don't want to Keep it to yourself. Uh, the mind races. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of cool. And that's going to Belgium and Netherlands as an exclusive. 
Oh, that's so, really cool. And then like we, yeah, we're just preparing lots of casts now at the moment for late for stuff later in the year. And then we're just continually working in the warehouse. Like we're getting stuff like Tom and I are Tom's a business partner and he's we're just messing around, figuring out what we need to operate at a bigger level. Mm-hmm. And like we're designing transfer pumps and things like that and getting them built and uh emptying troughs and we're get up upcycling things and getting involved in it ourselves rather than trying to buy like there is nothing off the shelf there isn't like you know there isn't a website you can go on to and say i need i need to get stuff for like a <laughs> independent bottling bonding right. warehouse somewhere <laughs> so so is it all you got to figure out what you need and then get it made for yourself yeah or design I, it. that's what i was going to ask like is it all just relationships with you know distilleries and and warehouses and that kind of thing in terms of no, this stuff is just literally we're getting this stuff because this is what we want for our warehouse gotcha. and there's no yeah. one like other people have different var- variations sure you, know, you see empty in troughs in, in in the u.s and uh, some of them are in the floors and you know, oh you're, you're talking like physically for the warehouse itself i'm with you now yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. lots of that stuff and that's really fun to be honest you know like i went down to a to a scrap yard and i found like six 450 liter like they're about 100 gallon uh, drums that were from a pharmaceutical plant, stainless steel. Uh, so I bought all of those and we're upcycling those to create an emptying trough. And that's, you know, it's just, just stuff like that. It's a bit of fun too. It's nice kind of, kind of gets your mind off other stuff, doing things like that, you know, transferring, emptying casks, refilling. It's the nice side of the job. It's the job you want to do, play with whiskey, you know, work with whiskey. That's, I'm really looking forward to the summer now because I get to do that and hang out here and it's a beautiful part of the world too. So the summer, the weather is pretty good and well, I don't and have to travel. From, so that's nice. From from this side of the of the equation, like it's been so nice. All of the like behind the scenes stuff y'all been sharing on on social media and stuff has been so cool to see like the warehouse and like the different things y'all been doing has been so interesting. Like so cool. Oh, good. Yeah, stuff. I'm glad you're liking it because it's, like I went from doing no social media, really. Yeah. I did our first videos the last week of December or something. Yeah. I heard a guy, Brian, he's a, he's a friend of ours. Like we know, I'd known him for a while. He's a big, he's a whiskey vlogger and he started, he was starting a new company. I said, Hey, I'll be your first line. There you go. I'll pay you peanuts. And you know, you'll get the <laughs> right. <laughs> and he's doing a great job. But like, I was nearly dead in those videos. Like we <laughs> shot like six or seven videos in a row. And I'm like, <laughs> right. about to pass out. Uh, no, they they're fascinating. Really after that. They're absolutely great. Yeah, they, they're getting better. Yeah, yeah for sure. And, well, and I, I think that that's that you're also willing to show those kinds of behind the scenes stuff. It's not just the the liquid in the bottle. There are people behind this. You know, you can talk to the individual who is making this stuff, who's putting all of this together, and you kind of like through building that. There's that relationship aspect where you know it's it's not. Ultimately, yes, it's about the whiskey, but it becomes more than that too. Yeah, it feels I love more that. than the brand. Absolutely. You know, it's not just the label that you're looking at. It's like, oh yeah, I know the the guy that that puts the liquid in. And we talked it. about this last time. I mean, yeah. Dai said, like, my name's on the bottle. I, I it has to be this, and I, I love that though. Yeah, yeah, and, for sure. And that's something that I wish, you know, to some degree, more distilleries here in America did, where it's it's not this, you know, just huge conglomerate thing. It's we actually like what we're doing. We right. like the stuff that we, we stand behind it and we like it. And here it is. And I, I think oh, that, yeah. that's like, what you I guys are doing. Job. Like, it, like, it, <laughs> yeah, I love your job too. <laughs> it's so good. Like, it, you know, I can't imagine if this, if this didn't work for whatever reason, I'd be like, what would I do? Right. Like, can you imagine going and having to find a job? Uh, so what are we doing last? <laughs> oh, I have my own whiskey company. Uh, <laughs> right. I drank whiskey for a living. <laughs> right. You know, and I'm it a truck awesome. driver now. now. What do you know? I'm, oh. you know, I'm a fucking sales agent at Amazon <laughs> Sports site or something. Right. Like <laughs> what are you doing now? Uh, real estate. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. You know, I uh. studied real estate. <laughs> Listen, Seriously. you and everybody studied, in Florida. <laughs> I studied property management and valuation and auctioneering. Wow. <laughs> Would you go yeah. back and do it over whiskey? My, I, I. Even when I fit, I was halfway through it and I said, I'm going to finish it just because I need to finish it. Yeah. And I was like, I'm never doing this. This is <laughs> the single, no offense to anybody who's a realtor. <laughs> this is the single most pointless job in the world. <laughs> like houses don't need agents to sell them. People need houses. Right. right. And they just sell themselves generally. Yeah. Like, you know, just build a website, put it on it and let people buy it. Right. Like, yeah. It's, 
it's not difficult. Yeah, it shouldn't be. And you, and then I knew as well. Obviously, the percentages were going to keep falling because because of that. So I was like, ah, I'm never going to get rich doing that. So I'll just get poor having a whiskey. Like <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. So before we continue our conversation, Dahi, you've sent us a, a couple of bottles here that we're going to sample and taste. Now that we've had the uh, refresher of the single grain, the the straight up ten year, which is is it? Would you say it's your flagship? The the single grain ten year. The Bill Phil is our flagship. The Bill Phil sure. is the flagship. Okay. It's like it's one of our core products. That's what I meant. I guess uh, well, core the, product. The Bill Phil for me is is I guess they're both flagships. They're sure. two core. They're the only two core products we have right now. So let's get into some of the stuff that is a little more rare. Yeah, like very, like some of it's extremely rare <laughs> and as a result, massively underpriced. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got some unicorn whiskeys there. Like you got two, I'll tell you, you got two single casts there. One is an Oloroso Bushmills and that is fully mature. When you were drinking that one, bear in mind, that's full cast strength. Whew. Bushmills, fully matured in an Oloroso butt for its entire life. Wow. wow. Okay. And it is like no other Bushmills you've ever tasted. I'm telling you. Yeah, I'm I don't think I've ever had that. Bushmills over 80. No. So 118.4. I, I be think a kick there's, the a, yeah, yeah. there's a prohibition version on the shelf over there. That, oh, okay. There you go. That one that they did for um, Peaky Blinders. I have that on the shelf. That's I, right. I don't, think we, I don't think you've had that. Yeah, but I, don't think, I don't think we've tried I think that's at 92. I haven't had that one myself. I'll have to yeah, check that one out. It's not bad. I don't, I don't know if they – I don't. did they market that over there for you guys? I, I don't recall seeing it, but that doesn't mean like, sure. I, you know, one time I would have recognized every new whiskey release and now I'm not so focused on what other people are doing anymore. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. How can yeah. you be? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty good. It's at, it's at 92. So I'm really interested what happens when you, you know, obviously Oloroso Sherry butts and kick it up to 118. Yeah. And it's amazing. Like, and it's not overly Oloroso. It's not overly nutty. It's, it's a third fill. Oloroso but so it allows the distillate to really be at the Ooh. at front and center, you know, and it's sure. just giving a little influence as opposed to dominating and being a blend component, I guess. And that's why they didn't use it because it wasn't a it's something that they could put into their their blends to give you all that cheriness, I guess. Um so then you got the and the, I think the one you're gonna have there is you're gonna have uh the Lockendal from Brooklady, which sure. is obviously quite a famous distillery that's not in Ireland. Well, you know, we could kind of claim ILA. We maybe we could take it back. I don't know. It's pretty close. <laughs> I support <laughs> it. <laughs> Listen, you can see it. You can see it from the north coast of Ireland. That's right, and vice versa. So they could make the claim too. <laughs> uh, I mean, if I, you want to yeah. mount a comeback, and and we could, if, I know a couple of people. We could go. We could probably make it happen, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> They're waiver to I'm sign. Pretty sure. I bet they wouldn't mind being in the EU right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. Yeah, that's a pretty special one. That's okay. 230 to 250 casks ever made. That's it. Wow. Wow. Well, let, let's yeah. let's jump into that one real quick before we go to and the. You got, what's the other I don't one know. You got I was there, thinking. From to here. We got the. I would go with player to here. To here first. I would too. Right. Down is a, is that's a gonna that's gonna peated. kill you. That's yeah. a good point. Okay, I just heavily peated in 126. Yeah, it's, that's gonna. You'll be surprised. It's really it's it's really fantastic. Okay. Uh, I don't we'll doubt get it. to it in a while, but the, from Claire to here, we should start with. It's a little lighter. It's only 109. Okay. Yeah. Tell so, us about this one. What was the from Claire to here? This is what the the label says. But I want to I want to hear from Dahi too. Uh, it says it's a bourbon cask, imperial stout cask, rum cask, single malt Irish whiskey. Comes in at 54.54 exactly. Nice. How, how did you come up with from Claire to here? So from Claire to here. Um, was a collaboration I did with, I got to know this guy on Twitter called Bridger Keller, who he's from Montana, actually. Um, originally, you know he's Montana. a brewer in County Clare. Oh. And a brewery called Western Herd. And it's on the west coast of Ireland. And we got to know each other over Twitter during COVID, you know, and I liked some of you know, we were all drinking way too much. We were, everyone was just buying beer from everywhere. And, you know, you remember how it was. Yep. And we were there. I really liked his stout. And we got chatting and he said he was working, he was using some whiskey casts and he wasn't having some, he wasn't really happy with the results. And I said, that's because you're not getting the right casts. You need to be getting a certain, like a whiskey cask is not just a whiskey cask. It's like anything. So I said, you need something a bit more flavorful, fresher. Um, and I said, you know, I haven't really been impressed with Imperial stout finishes that I've, that I've seen. Mm -hmm. Cask finishes or any beer cask finish actually really. So I said, I wouldn't mind having a go at maybe trying to see if I can do one that I think is better than all the rest. So, <laughs> so I 
get Bridger a barrel and he put the Imperial Stout into it and I, I took it back off and then a few months later and I refilled it then with the same style of malt that was in it, which was a double distilled malt. Oh. About five and a half years old at the time. So he fermented or he aged the stout in the he cask? He aged his okay. stout and he got a, he got whiskey barrel aged stout. Gotcha. So Imperial uh, Stout high proof. So it's like it's right. 10% ABV, it's so 20 proof or whatever. It's a real nice, it's a, like you, you could pour it into a wine glass and enjoy it. Like it's really rich and beautiful. Decadent. And um, I put the whiskey into it and ultimately I fucked it up. So <laughs> it, went, it went a little... Now it was good, but it just got a little bitter, and stout stout can be quite bitter, yeah. Sure, sure. And um, it just got a little too bitter, and it went away from the distillate being where it came from, which was nice and sweet. And I wanted to get it back. I could have bottled it. I was like, no, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna fix this somehow. And we got some rum casks in, and I just said, hey, let's stick some rum into that uh, and see what happens. And it did, and this was the result. And I think it's a uh, fantastic results, that's, really. that's <laughs> wild I, I love that that it's okay this is not the flavor profile that we wanted or that i like so now let's take that and see what we can do with it right so let's see what happens when we do xyz that's that's fantastic let me see if i have a bottle here so you can see what it looks like because it was a fun thing we were doing i changed the label up completely oh super cool that's cool yeah so it's just like scribbled on there, right. right there to here. Not taking itself too seriously, you know. I love that. Well, it's crazy. Um, like before, I even got this to my nose. Just one from when you opened it and poured it in the glass. The idea of the stout, that dark caramelly molassesy note, was already like in the air. Yeah, and, and it's it's that sweet, slight bitter of a stout when you pour like a good, heavy imperial stout. Yeah into that, you know, smaller chalice or even a wine glass, like Dali said, yeah, that you get that lovely multi note. And it was absolutely like, even outside of the, just pouring it into the Glencairn, it's, it's in the room and it's fantastic. Yeah. And then when you bury your nose in it, (laughs) there is so much going on with that. There's there's chocolate. I didn't even, I didn't do tasting notes. I was like, how, how, how? like, where do you, where do you start? (laughs) So how many, you just did one cask of this? Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. I did one cask, and it was supposed to go to the U.S. actually, and then because the shipping costs were so high, I had brought a bottle on a trip to Belgium just to get some market feedback and see if maybe they'd be interested in it. And they were like, "Oh, let, will you do a cask for our market immediately?" Everyone loved it. And then I just came back from that trip, and I said, "Hey, do you want this cask? Because I have a bottle and ready to go. If you don't mind the fact that it has a U.S. import label on the back." <laughs> It's true, yeah. It's oh, yeah. DTB <laughs> approved. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, that. That's there. And they were like, no, no, send it over. And they took it, the whole thing. And I got paid the next day. So that's great. It was great. So we started, we did some more of them this year. So we did three barrels this year. We did one with a Buffalo Trace barrel pick that my, my pal John had in the Carrier Killarney. And this time I wanted to try and get the stout right. And we have. Nice. And it's really good. And I had it at the tasting last night. It's 55.6%. 56 percent and it's a seven-year-old malt now Ooh. same malt seven years old but it was it was never an irish whiskey barrel it went straight into buffalo trace barrel and then still I did the rum then with the same malt but now we have the stout profile right on it without the rum gotcha and then i've also then finished i've just filled in another one we did two other barrels and i put one of them back into bourbon and i put one into rum again and so we'll have another from Claire to here coming at some point later this year. So hopefully some of that will see the States in, in the fall. We'll be looking for it. Yeah, absolutely. You know what it knows is like to me? What? It knows is like uh, those the chocolate, no bake oatmeal cookies. Like it's, <laughs> it it's, does. Uh, yeah. it's such a heavy whiskey. If you can imagine the density of it, if people are listening, like it wa- there's a weight in it in your mouth, isn't there? Like yeah. It's- yeah, definitely. The, the viscosity is definitely high, but it's not super oily. I, I think like it's just, thick might be right it's dense, it's heavy dense it's dense. Yeah. dense is perfect yeah. it's like yeah. dark matter you know <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah it's not clingy <laughs> no oh man but that that stouty aftertaste on yeah. it yeah is impeccable off of a whiskey see and i i get more stout on the nose and i get rum notes on the back end of the palate i mean you get obviously irish whiskey that, that same kind of like beautiful lovely friendly kind of thing totally but then there's that 
rum cask that I'm getting on the back end. That it's like it's almost this other layer of sweet. And maybe that's where the I guess like the the sorghumy kind of dark sugar sweet comes from too. Right. Is that some of that rum nature? I, listen, I know you said you fucked it up, but I think you didn't because this is fantastic. <laughs> it's incredibly <laughs> interesting and like deep. Like the depth of it is impressive. It's like pondering. Yeah, I don't think there's a, I take it, I, I said to you, it's like, it's not like any single malt you've ever tasted. No, it's no, really not. not at all. I, I don't know how you would make tasting notes for this because each sip yeah. is different. I mean, it truly yeah. is. It's not yeah. just unpacking layers. It's like, wait, what happened here? There's something else now. Yeah, that last sip was almost like cola esque. Yeah, it's super interesting. Yeah, it's good. It was, I was really, really proud of this one and really happy. And it was like, it's just experimental and it's trying to figure out. Look, just you know, I want to be happy with everything I put into a bottle. And sure. Nine out of ten other people would have bottled that stout cask, and it would have been like it wasn't that bad. Like to right. be honest, <laughs> just for me, it's like no, right? I'm not doing it. And and you mentioned this to us last time we talked. It's you're creating things that you want to be happy with. It's not just okay. I did a thing, and we got to bottle it and put it out. It's here's what I did. I think it could be better, or I think the flavor notes could be a little bit different. Here's what I'm really looking for. Let's try this and see what happens. And I appreciate yeah. that. So it's it's a fun one, and uh, the label is fun. And yeah, we're doing the one we're doing next is pretty good. The label is like, cause from Claire to here is a song, it's a mm-hmm. famous song. If you Google it, it's about a guy who's feeling homesick from Ireland. He's over in San Francisco or California. He likes to drink a lot, and he's from County Clare, and it's a long, long way from Claire to here. Is the song? Oh, and, uh, talk. We were bottling another whiskey. And I didn't know what we we're going to call this collaboration series. I don't know what we're going to do with this. Tom, Tom who works with me, he's from Texas, and he's you know, he moved to Ireland, and he said, uh, "Where's where's Claire, how far is Claire from here?" And I started singing. It's a long, long way. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Oh, we're going to call it that, and we're just going to we're just going to use songs as is for inspiration for this collaboration series." So the next one is another song, like a bit of a historical folk song. That's cool. Cheeky one, a cheeky one. That's going to be the one for Carry Out Killarney. So it'll have the same look and feel, but the text will change and the colors may change. It's clear that you're having fun with it. It's not that you don't take the the whiskey itself seriously. It's you also understand like th- this has to be fun because it's meant to be shared. It's meant to have a story and it's it should be a good time in this as a whole. Yeah, just got, like our like a lot of our, our branding, as you can see, is quite classic uh you know it's very clean and straight and looks very serious i guess and that's because it is serious whiskey but we're not serious people exactly uh so it's we take i take my whiskey seriously but i also take enjoyment seriously too so it's, uh, i love it we like to have fun and you know if you ever come to one of our tasting events like you know i i my face is sore from laughing so much last night we, just, <laughs> we don't we don't do uh i don't do tasting notes I, at events we just talk and we have a chat and you know if people want to offer their opinion it's cool but i don't try and guide and lead people down down a certain direction you know and we yeah. always say that ourselves like if a bottle comes with tasting notes we try to avoid those yeah until after we've had the drink then it's yeah, interesting to see them. what they say if yeah you look at our earlier bottles i used to put like highlight tasting notes on the back of every bottle and then i just went you know what just because I taste this doesn't mean anybody else taste it. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, and that's, that's what that's what I've point. noticed, too, of like, you know, taste is such a weird thing that if you say, I should get this out of it and I don't, does that make the, the end user like, oh, well, I, I didn't get that note. Maybe I'm not tasting this correctly or maybe I'm not refined enough or, or whatever. But whenever... We or, have conversations with, you know, friends and listeners and, and we've done tastings. It's always, here's what I get, but we always tell that at the end, you know, what, what are you tasting out of this? And don't, you know, don't hold back. If you taste, I don't know, old leather shoe, yeah. tell us that. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, like interesting. I love, I love when people do that. Like I'm getting, you know, burnt rubber or new <laughs> tires or huh. oily rags. And you're like, and, I, and you're like, really? And you're like, and they're like, yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> Whatever, man. You know, I love chocolate and nuts and stuff like that. So that's what I'm going to get. <laughs> you know, hazelnuts and dark chocolate. Like, there's something you want to taste, you know, or, you know, liquid bacon. I mean, that's pretty good. That's, yeah. I've always thought about, like, it'd be really funny if we ever did something and just, like, throw out just, like, super bizarre tasting notes to see if those catch on. Like, what does it smell like? Well, have you ever been in a field where a horse is given birth? 
Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what. It, what? And it's delightful. <laughs> like there was a <laughs> hobbit <know>. roasting <laughs> asparagus. A uh, hot placenta. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> you know, just, something like, just something ridiculous. And like, are people going to be like, yeah, I totally get that too. No, I agree. Yeah. Well, you know, you, know, you get influenced. <laughs> exactly. You know, you know I'm I searching love, for I love how now. you flow your conversation goes, even when I'm here, right? So because I was listening to the start of your last podcast on May 3rd with the Mandalorian. I'm yeah. sorry I couldn't do that one with you. And no worries. I was like, how do you go from getting like, you know, you got Justin Timberlake in there. <laughs> you got, you got uh, General Palpatine in there. Yeah, real uh, quick. All in the first like three minutes. Yeah. Uh, there was a few other ones. And I was just laughing my ass off in the car. Like, to it. And then somebody called me and interrupted my, uh, my enjoyment. So I didn't get to finish it yet. But I was like, I love how it's a bit like Tom and I, we could have, we could be talking about anything at work. If people, if there was a camera on us, it would, we'd probably get arrested, but <laughs> Uh, it's pretty funny, like the tangents you go off on, and here we are talking about you know a horse's afterbirth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's a potential tasting. If Nick wasn't a great <laughs> editor. Yeah, yeah. We, we've probably already been arrested. That's too. exactly it. I was I was literally having that conversation <laughs> with a friend today, and he's like, you know, you guys generally keep it pretty tight around that, you know, fifty to an hour, uh, fifty minute to an hour, and I'm like. Yeah, but we record for like an hour and a half, and I cut a lot. There's a lot that doesn't go. In. <laughs> I'm surprised you don't talk for maybe longer than that. I thought it'd be like at least a two hour rambling to get that to one. But. Well, I think uh, I think we realized like okay, at some point we just gotta end this. So yeah. we can... <laughs> <laughs> So I was listening. To you were talking about Mando. I got, yeah. I got that far and season three and different opinions on it yeah actually we'd, we'd like to hear your opinion what what you think of it because we know you're a big star wars fan yeah yeah like i i'm i'm a bit in the middle of both i was a, i was like season one and season two were really great season three was it was enjoyable it mm -hmm. was fine i thought the ending was terrible <laughs> like, <laughs> you know he's sitting out on the on the veranda <laughs> <laughs> exactly i was like oh man come on like this is you know it needed a bit of grit, and we were missing the grit. And, Ooh, that's yeah. a good point. The, you know, but yeah. it was like I enjoy. I I still enjoyed it. I still watched it all, and I felt there was a big opening there for when we saw the what's the name of that creature that they have on there. Oh, the the, uh, the flying one. No, the no the, the dragon one underwater. Thing. Oh, uh, uh, the mythosaur. I was like mythosaur. I was like, when is like yes. where is that going? When is that going to appear again? And like they just gave us a glimpse of an eye opening underwater, and that was it. Right. Yeah. I was like, surely that's coming back into this story. Yeah. So there was a lot of there was a lot of ways it could have went that it didn't go. It kind of got a bit, you know. I think I felt it got rushed. Yeah, I think so too. I felt they kind of tried to put too much into eight episodes, and you saw that near the end of uh, you know Game of Thrones. It was like Jesus, like how do you ruin one of the greatest TV shows in life? Well, you just do what they did in the last two episodes. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it, it's almost like, okay, we, we've got to speed this up and wrap it up, but we've yeah. spent two seasons setting up these plot points, and then you're going to wrap up a plot point in an episode, or you're going to wrap up a plot point, but make it continue in that same sense? Like, I, I, Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's... Like, if they if they had put two more episodes in, yep. they probably they probably would have just made... I don't know. Well, and we're, we're all experts, obviously. Oh, so. yeah. You clearly. know, it. <laughs> I've, I've made so many TV shows and I've written so many episodes, <laughs> but it, it, I don't know. It also feels like, and I think we talked about this. It, it feels to me like some of the subplot elements, I don't know if it's setting up something for the future, but it, it just felt unneeded because what are you there for? You're, you're there for the Mandalorian, you know? Yeah you have a whole episode on this doctor character, which I get you're trying to establish the cloning aspect a little bit more. Yeah, like they went into so much depth on that and then it was just done. Yeah, yeah never talked about it again. So maybe this is kind of like a filler season, like a filler episode. Right. And then the next season is going to be, I certainly, if there is going to be a next season, I assume there is. Uh, I yeah, I definitely think there will be. Like I think the, the, the IP for The Mandalorian is still really high. Like I think, you know, there's a lot of, need for it there's a lot of demand for it i definitely think they'll continue on with the story but this season specifically to me it just felt so different tonally from the previous two seasons that it was like borderline off-putting and like anybody that i talked to about it i may have said it in that episode like i dare you to go back and watch the first episode of season one and how i did yeah and it's so different yeah. And, it, and like I watched it after that last episode, I went put it on. It was like this is not the same show. Not no. even close. No, like 
This, and don't this worry, is I still everything. enjoy that. And you know what? They do season four. I'll watch every one of them. For sure. I, I mean, it's, it's still Star I Wars. Love the whole, you know, it's it, it's an escape from reality for forty four year old man. So. Absolutely. Like I'll be there for it. <laughs> but it, this one was just it just was so different. And I think I think you nailed it. Like it it lost a lot of grit, and it just felt like softer around the edges. Mm. It felt more like the animated series that they do with Star Wars. It kind of felt more in that tonal range than what the live action from that we've seen from like. Hey, Andor. I think I think Bad Batch has a bit more grit than that. You're not two. wrong. Yeah. You're totally right. Yeah, Bad yeah. Batch season two was gritty. I like Bad Batch. I, mean, I enjoyed that. I do too. I, I yeah. I'm really fascinated to see where they're taking. It's a good all concept. Of that. Yeah, for sure. As much as we're nitpicking and like, here's what we liked, here's what we didn't like. It comes from this. At least for me, I believe in it. I want to see it succeed. I, I love Star Wars, and I want to see what happens. And the things that I'm like, ah, uh, you guys kind of whiffed on that one. It's not because I'm you know hating on it. It's like. Man, I wish I wish you had done just a little bit more. Give me a but little guess, bit more. I guess also if we kind of sit back and be a bit more, you know, reflective on it, the whole thing, the whole Star Wars range of spin-offs and and that, I guess they all can't be and or either, you know. Ex- exactly. Really, right. You know, this has a little more campiness to it, a little more fun. You know, the one-liners, things like that, that are that come from the original Star Wars as well. You know, yeah. think about Han Solo and. Maybe that's what they have to do to give it balance. Because every, if everything's like Andor, then we won't appreciate Andor for what it is. Exactly. I, I went recently went back and watched uh, A New Hope, and there's so much, and you know, it's something that I do fairly often. But there's so much camp. There's so much about it that's like that's a little weird. But because it is Star Wars, there's a lot of nostalgia. So like, I think the thing is really good. For nostalgia's sake, too. But if you were to release that today, people would be like, "What the hell?" Is oh yeah, it? like that's terrible. That's so. It's that right? Yeah, that it'd be like a B movie. Yeah, exactly. Straight, straight to DVD. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so you're, you're. I think you're right. Like they're writing this line of how do we stay true to Star Wars, which is a little campy. The ears flop and move, and they're not supposed to. You know, things like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or like, you know, how many beeps can R two D two do? Right. But also playing into that nostalgia, knowing that you know us that love it we're we're going to watch it because we like it you know it's it's oh, like yeah. it's like marvel there are marvel movies that are just knocking it out of the park and then there's swinging a miss yeah. there's some terrible ones <laughs> i think there's uh, that, that that quote too of like nobody hates star wars like star wars fans <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well that, there's a lot of similarities in whiskey fans and star wars fans right. too you know like do you ever hear anybody else complain on on platforms about the price of everything <laughs> going up right <laughs> other than whiskey fans you know yeah it's a luxury item you do not need to have it right yeah uh, you're not entitled to every bottle that every <laughs> distillery makes you right. know you weren't born into royalty and that says you are allowed to have this limited release one-off bottling just because you bought one 15 years ago <laughs> yeah for 50 right pounds. yeah and you know when the, and when bmw bring out a you know a new supercar people are gone Fuck, never buy another BMW again. Those <laughs> motherfuckers. <laughs> you know, they, they, they just brought a car that I can't afford anymore. <laughs> Ridiculous. And, yeah. You know, you just, if you can't afford it, you just don't buy it. And that's what it is. And we, I think Star Wars fans and whiskey fans are definitely a big crossover. Yeah. It's probably why we like both so much. Yeah, I think you're right. We fit, yeah. we fit the avenue What more for do both. you want? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's funny, you know, part of Facebook groups and Twitter and, and conversations that we have. And it's exactly that. Yeah. It's, well, I found a so and so, and it was, you know, $300 for in secondary. It's like, yeah, because that's what it's going for right now. That doesn't mean you have to buy it. Yeah. And I, that doesn't mean I also disagree that, like, should it be $300? No, but that's what it is. That's just unfortunately what yeah, it is. Here you are. Do you want the bottle or not? Yeah. That doesn't yeah, mean that like, I'm not, that doesn't mean know, I'm not going to bitch I, about I it because I'm going to bitch about I it. Never. I never get upset when I see a bottle of six. But I go, well, it is what it is. Yeah, you do not have to buy it. Stop complaining. And also, sorry, I'm going to rant. I'm going to pontificate here again. Do it, oh buddy. You know, people will go out and they'll fucking spend fifty quid on fifty dollars on a bottle of gin, right? Right. It was made in one day. It cooled and got bottled. It's a three day <laughs> process. Okay. And then, you know, somebody brings out a you know a three year old whiskey. Right? It's only three years old. Like you're like, not fucking three days, like, <laughs> three years old. 
Like <laughs> it went into wood. Right. It was stored in an expense, you know, it, you know, everything about it was expensive. Yeah. Uh, it had to get distilled, you know, two or three times or in copper, you know, it's not neutral spirit. And we got a basket and threw some fruit into it and dropped it in. And <laughs> away we go. Like no offense to gin makers. Sorry. But like, <laughs> again, I appreciate a good gin. I just, I hate when people complain about, oh, you know, I'd prefer if that whiskey was 25 pounds. You know, I'd prefer if a Ferrari was $40,000. Absolutely. Like, but it's not. I think whiskey companies get a hard time, especially new whiskey companies. Like, for example, when I was looking at opening a distillery back in the day, 2013, 10 years ago, I was in an opening distillery. And it was quite a big plant that I was on the Foresight's and I had an email from Richard Foresight on the on what it was going to cost me to buy his plant. Okay, Foresight's are, the, are very famous still makers in Scotland, right? So this plant was a 3.75 ton plant. That's mm -hmm. a 3.75 ton mash. So that's about a million LPA. Okay. Right. It's a good size. The price point on it was about 2.8 million pounds. <laughs> you laugh, right? <laughs> yeah. If he offered you that for 2.8 million pounds today, yeah. you would take it. Oh, absolutely. That's, ten, that's 10 years ago. That's 10 years so imagine ago. Imagine what that cost, you know, 20 years ago, 30 right. years ago, 40 years ago, or 50 years ago. When a lot of these the Scottish distilleries, the, or the older established ones were setting up, sure. or were already set up, versus what people have to pay today. For that money, you wouldn't get a, you might get a one ton mash today. Right. So one that's almost four times smaller. You, you know, and people are, are like, oh yeah, how dare you charge, you know, 60, 70 euros. For I don't a have a choice. I have to. Like, you know, again, don't buy it then. Yeah, yeah. it's not for you. <laughs> well, it's not like. And, and those, know, those older brands, I mean, I, yeah, I think what Jameson's been around since the late 1700s. So of course they can sell whiskey for twenty five dollars US because they've done it for three hundred years. Right. You know, they like, made the investment a long time. Exactly. Ago. So in that case, of course, sure. Right. I mean, and maybe that's not a, a great um, analogy, but yeah, if you if you're a brand new company, you can't afford not to sell your whiskey at a higher price point. Right. Yeah, it's unfair. And I think people don't, and whiskey fans don't give whiskey producers, I think they feel they're out to rip them off and they're not, right? Really, you know, like I don't ever look at a whiskey and say, I want it to be at this price point. I go, what has it cost me? Right. How much time and effort has gone into it? You know, like sometimes our labels and some of our bottles cost like five euros a label. Right. On our, on our single cast bottles because we're doing so few of them and they're so detailed. You know, some, I think one time there were nine euros. A wow. Label. You know what I mean? And it's right? a like, that's a label. Yeah, and the bottle was on sale for maybe 170 euros. Right. Doing all the taxes and everything. So like we spent, you know, we don't we don't make anything near the price on the shelf. You know, we're making a lot less than that. So it's it's interesting that people I don't know, for people who are so into it to not appreciate it or not be able to differentiate then between a large producer or multinational like Pernod Ricard or Diageo or Jose Cuervo versus you know, Joe Soap down the road with his stills that he bought with his son's probably fucking money that he had put aside for his education. He's going, <laughs> I'm going to get rich on this whiskey business. I promise I'll pay it back. <laughs> that kind of thing. And it's it's a bit, you kind of wonder how you can be such a big whiskey fan and then not be able to differentiate the industry and say, like, I am not in the same business as Jameson. No. I say that people. We're not in the same business. Nope. There's no similarities to our business, you know? Whiskey. It says whiskey in the bottle. That's about it. And there's like there's like a separation between like just the understanding of I feel like I'm because I'm a, I'm a fan that I'm owed some sort of um, special treatment. Like you've got to yeah, understand like the people business do better their than best, that. You know, yeah. right? I find. Well, I don't I, think anyone's out to try and rip anybody off. You know, and I think a lot of the a lot of the ire is directed at the whiskey maker when the ire should really be directed at the whiskey market. At, right. at least here in America, because, you know, I, I know you've got a, a bottle of uh, a stag junior there and that bottle at retail is not a very expensive bottle. I mean, here in the States anyway, you're, you're looking at what, a hundred, give or take. Oh, no, I think retail sh should only be like 60. OK, but I know yeah, I paid about a, I paid about 90 euros in Ireland because it, our, our our taxes on sure. size and alcohol are huge. Sure. Like the tax this is 63.2. So. It's probably about 
20 euros tax plus VAT, sales tax on top of that. Because it's, so, it's taxed by percentage, correct? Yeah, it's 42 euros 57 per liter of pure alcohol. Oh, uh, okay. So, you guys, like, it's about $2 in the right, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. But so, God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the ire, it's, you know, people are, and we've, we've done it. Everyone who is in the whiskey world has done it at some point. Well, Buffalo Trace, Buffalo Trace. Because it's easy to do that when it's not necessarily Buffalo Trace, it's you know uh, the whiskey market, and to some degree, even local whiskey sellers going like, well, they know what they'll get for it. Sure, like I know that I could sell this at cost at 60, uh, 60 bucks or, or ninety euros, but if I sell it for one hundred and twenty or three hundred, I've made why two hundred percent, and people are going to buy it. So to some degree, the whiskey consumer is also perpetuating that problem too. But it's free market. It's like anything. It's like, you know, it's, it's house prices, whiskey price, you know, whatever you're willing to pay for it. That's what, that's what it will cost. You don't have to buy, you know, I actually don't buy bottles probably over. I buy the odd bottle over 200. Very rarely. I go over 300. Very rarely. Something special like a 1979 Armagnac or something or. Ooh, oh, ooh. I got some of those there. They're pretty. I got some castor and cognac. 1979. I do not have. I don't think you've got. No, I, I do not. <laughs> I do not have any of that. Nope. Yeah. Well, it, I uh, think yeah. Dahi is is raising the proof. I feel like we should too. Oh, yes, yeah, that's, that's true. He's got the stag junior. Yeah, I feel like that's a good call. That was a good segue. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so Dahi, tell us about the the Caledonia series, the Lock and Doll by Brooklotic, uh, which is a heavily peated. Whiskey comes in at 126. Yes, this is a 10 year old single malt Ooh. at 126. So it was barreled at quite a high ABV, probably in at around 72, maybe into the barrel on Phil. Um, it's a Lockendal from Brookladdock. And anyone who's an ILA fan will know that Lockendal is a lighthouse there. And there used to be a distillery called Lockendal there too, I believe. But Brookladdock, when they were being kind of re energized, I guess, and, and, and ramped up again, they Jim McEwen. You know, they have the Laddie, which is non-peated. Then they had the the Rins, mm -hmm. and they sold all the Rins cast there about 25, 30 ppm, I think, peated. And then they did the Port Charlotte, which is about 45 ppm, I think. And then they did this, the Lock and Down, mm -hmm. 55 ppm, the Octomore, 80 ppm plus. Yeah. So. The lock and dial and the rings were sold to investors to generate cash flow for the industry. Oh, for the business. Okay. And um, there was only about 250 barrels of this done. And they were all sold. And I'm a, I'm a fan of some Brooklyn physics. Like, that's the thing. I wouldn't say I like all of them, but lock and dials I had, I was a big fan of. They're a bit cult. They have a bit of a cult status, you know, for people who are, if you're into Brooklyn. Um, so if you're not a real, real hardcore Brooklyn fan, you might probably have never heard of it. Mm -hmm. So they only did 250 casks of this, and they haven't. I think they only released one of those casks themselves as a distillery, and the rest have all been into private investors' hands, been bottled by independent bottlers. Interesting. Um, so this is 10 years. Uh, I bottled it uh, two years ago, and I got access to it through. I'm a Lock and I was a big Lock and fan through independent bottlings I had, and. A guy called Ian Garrett, who runs the Friends of Brooklyn Facebook page, is a friend of mine here in Ireland, and he introduced me to somebody who owns some cast of it. And I was able to get some cast samples and go through them, and I picked this one, and I bottled it. So this is this is me being an independent bottler in the truest sense of the word, and that you'd know as independent bottlers do, you find a cast and bottle it. Right. And it's not often I do that. You know, the, the Bushmills that was there, you have, that was one of them, and this is the other one. And every other time... I bought the stock and had it for a while and I worked with it or recast it, et cetera. This is 55 p.m. distilled by Jim McCune, uh, the legendary Jim McCune, 2010, and 63.1% ABV after 10 years. Whew. And honestly, I'm just going to pop the cork in it because I have, it, I have a jar stag in my glass. So, and I, I don't drink this too often because I don't have any more of it left. So it's one of the finest whiskeys I've ever had at 10 wow. years old. And it just goes to show you that age is not everything you know that's something that you opened my eyes up about when we when we were talking that idea of you know so so many people are focused so heavily on age that that's you know i hate to be cliche but the age is just a number if if the the whiskey is great at four years 
the whiskey's great at four years. It doesn't mean it's going to be great at eight years. It doesn't mean it's going to be great at 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. Like it, it, it could be great at 17 years and be terrible at 19 years. Like you really don't know. Not terrible, but it, it might not be as good. Right. It's not linear. You know, nothing about whiskey is linear. Right. Like, you know, you'll see a pro. Sorry, you will see a progression in the first few years. That's that's a very steep curve. Mm -hmm. But then it doesn't follow that curve anymore. Right. You know, and it's really interesting to see that. Seems like it's more this, like a... This is the example. Like, this is good. Just bottle it. You don't need to wait till it's 12. Right. Or wait till it's 15. Like, you know, if it's nine, put it in a bottle and make it nine, you know, and that's... It doesn't matter. And this is... I think this is exceptional, I think. What I really like is that it's not... Like, it's definitely peated. You know it's peated. But it's not like... That's not the only note on the nose. There's a, a really nice sweetness. Yeah. Like so early. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, like, the, to me, uh, a after nosing it now for, you know, a minute or so, the peat's almost diminished. Yeah. And, and I've moved on to these, like, distilled floral notes. Yeah. Like, really rich floral notes and, like, fruit. Fruit's good. Yeah. Like, like distilled berries, like, really dense dark berries lots of fruit and then when you when you do finally taste it i i mentioned something earlier that is a tasting note and let's see if you get it okay shall we and then what hint hint it's not a horse's afterbirth <laughs> damn it i was leaning uh, I, I don't know i was like am i gonna get it <laughs> hard am to I gonna go get in that way <laughs> that because I, I definitely haven't tasted that so i wouldn't know oh, <laughs> man i just watched a youtube video anyway about a I don't want to. It's know. all right. I don't worry. Okay. <laughs> man, we share a YouTube account. Are you, you're watching on your personal account. Okay, good. <laughs> wow, man. That finishes for days. That proof is amazing. That to me, like, that, that makes everything in the whiskey sing. I mean, it's up there. Whew. But that is delightful. I'm getting like, I'm getting some, some dark chocolate, but in like a, like you're sitting around a campfire eating some dark chocolate. I think the sweet dissipates from the sweet on the nose, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. It just, it, it kind of takes that back seat. Sure. Mm, that's fantastic. I get this to my mom. She was 71 years old at the time. She never had a peated single malt whiskey in her life. And I gave her this and she went, isn't that delightful? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, yeah. She loved it. That's fantastic. Wow. Yeah. Because it's not, it's not just peat. No. It's not just Oh, no, smoke. not at all. You know, it's Which, a component and that's where it should be. It should be a component for me. Like I, I cannot drink peat whiskey. That is just peat. It right. just doesn't. And I like, and that's again, it's like peated malt is not just peated malt. And going back to the category thing earlier, and this is a ex prime example of that, you know, this is yeah. 55 PPM. And if you compare that to the Billfield cast strength that you have there, which is also 55 PPM, and it's a completely different. Yeah whiskey because it's triple distilled versus double distilled it was barreled at 63 percent versus 72 percent you you mentioned um the octomore that and i've, I've had it and I, I don't i'm assuming you've had it too yeah. and that to me leans gimmicky only because it's how much peat can we just cram into this thing and at some point it becomes this isn't about the whiskey it's about a peat number it's about a ppm and i understand it but it, to me it, it just becomes like what else is going on here because you're just throwing so much peat. Whereas something like this, what Dahi, you just mentioned, it's the the peat is playing within the band. It's not the lead yeah. singer. It's playing within the band. It's it's part of it. And I, I love that about it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's more the E Street band, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we call a callback. <laughs> yeah. So uh, but it is though. It, it, it's yeah. just complimented. And that's what I try to achieve with the Bill Phil mall when I'm doing that. And it complements it. it. This is just I like if you could get this whiskey and just keep making this whiskey. Imagine, imagine having that as a core expression. Oh like, my god! My god! Oh yeah! <laughs> get out of here! It's just insanely good. There's something really and interesting. Feel free to say it's not. Sorry, but for me, it's insanely good. Oh yeah, it no, is. I agree. And I, I did nothing to it. Like I literally am a fanboy, and I went out and I wanted to do one as my first Scotch bottle, which is pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it is. And you know. That's that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be cool in my forties, and, <laughs> and, and absolutely not. nailing it. By the way, I don't know. I'm nail nailing it to all the whiskey nerds in the world. Maybe. That's right. Not even all of them, to be honest. Uh, 
but yeah like it's just exceptional whiskey and uh it's amazing that they chose not to pursue this style there, i wonder what i was just thinking that too. Right? because yeah. i'm not a port charlotte fan at all what, what is the i wonder what the rationale is maybe it's too expensive to produce or maybe they're just like here's our one-off this is all we're doing because i i agree this over port charlotte all day i mean i i'm wondering if it it's a um you know it's a, if it's an issue of popularity sure if, if just like the isla style yeah where this this i don't feel like this is quintessential you know brooding isla mm. this is a little bit has a little bit more finesse and yeah you know finesse is good roundness a little where less port little charlotte less i feel like is a little bit more of a you know a kick to the groin <laughs> or can be can be yeah and and how is that because it's a less it's lesser ppm right and it's younger whiskey right hmm. you know uh and the abv is way smaller it's because i tried you know i tried maybe six i think six samples of this and they were all really good but one this one jumped out but to say that this one was a unicorn like it was completely different from the rest it wasn't that much different that you couldn't see that there was definitely a, a style there that could be reproduced right you know yeah, it's it. I find it maybe the, maybe the fifty five is is more expensive to buy. The fifty five ppm probably malls and things like that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe they felt people weren't ready for it. Maybe uh, and then they end up doing Octomore and they just bypass it completely. And Port Charlotte was such a success at that time. Then you know what do you do? Well, may, and and maybe you're right. Maybe it's just marketability in the world of whiskey. There's always that this brand has gone away. We're gonna bring it back, and we need a resurgence of cash flow, like you said, for some reason, or we're just interested in what we can now do. Uh, so let's let's try to bring that expression back. Who knows? Yeah. Well, yeah. It's 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 for me. This is one of the the nicest bottlings I've done. Like, and yeah. Wow. I, I just can't afford to buy any more of it. Like the price just went. You know, the next year, the price is just almost doubled. Wow. So it just became, you know, unsustainable to do. That's fantastic. Um, I'm curious, what was what was the note? Because I'm on the aftertaste, as I worked through it, it goes into like this, for me anyway, it's like an herbally, almost botanically nature towards the end. And it, and it finishes. See, I'm the complete opposite. I, I, we don't have the same palate, I think, right? So obviously we, nobody does the same, but I can, I, I listened to some of the whiskeys you've had versus some I haven't, we were very different on them. Sure. And that's not a bad thing, by the way. For me, this one is like caramelized barbecued bacon that was put in a blender. <laughs> they drink it. I love the sound of it. So that's what I get. Caramel. So, that's, so, the so overriding, that's the overriding flavor profile for me on this. Caramelized. Caramel. Caramel bacon liquefied. Like it's just see, and that that right there is why I love whiskey. That you know, you have three guys who know whiskey, who have sampled a bunch of whiskey, and we've each got I know nothing about whiskey. Sorry. Uh, you, you are <laughs> lying. Not a thing. Three guys who know whiskey, and yet even in that, I'm gonna say expertise, even in that expertise, we're getting three different things. And I love that. That yeah. to me is what's interesting about whiskey is that I'm getting these dark chocolate kind of notes. Dahi's getting blended caramelized bacon and you're getting botanicals. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like, wild. And it all makes sense to me. Like all Somebody, of that One sense. of us had a healthier upbringing. I'm not going to say it was, but obviously not the guy, not the guy who, who, who thinks about liquefied bacon. Well, you ate your greens, my son. You ate your greens. <laughs> uh, I did have a, a odd fascination with broccoli for a long time <laughs> yeah but you also ate microwave fucking cookie dough for breakfast in high school so and enjoy it delightfully it, it's uh, i mean it's <laughs> no <laughs> well we were having a bit of a twitter spat uh a few of us like we call them spats just a bit of bit of banter i suppose to use that awful english term sure <laughs> um myself and bill and Anne, a journalist and another guy and uh, they were i think there was some comment about food types and somebody said oh what would you put on this and i said oh i'd put i'd put uh peanut butter toast and i said i'd put peanut butter and blackberry jam mm. and you know bill and ann was disgusted <laughs> was like, that, is, that is awful you know <laughs> and then i said hey bill if you want to think you want to hear something disgusting check out cottage cheese crunchy peanut butter and a banana uh, cottage cheese crunchy pe i could see that working 
I could see that but totally it's working. Really good. I could yeah, totally see like that working. Like a bit of a sour with kind of a. Well, that's like what, what did? Uh... It is really. It's 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 pretty filling. I'll tell you. I bet. <laughs> yeah. I bet. Uh, I used to when I played rugby years ago. I used to eat that. You know, you'd be training a few times and you'd be like eating so much or whatever. Yeah. You just have this to just get calories. calories into you. Yeah. And it was like a dessert, honestly. I yeah. actually used to look forward to it. <laughs> it looked awful. <laughs> you know, curds and you know chunks, and you're like mashing it up. And it's like you're, you're about to feed it to a baby or something. Um, a, a very un, unfortunate baby. And uh, it's really good. I, I kind of mess around with flavors when I was in the kitchen if no one's around. And uh, I was feeling peckish the other night. And I was looking in the fridge. And I found some nice cheese. I had some nice cheese. I love cheese. Yeah. Like, who doesn't like? If you don't like cheese or bacon, you can't be trusted. Right? <laughs> yeah. so I was going to have I had, I had some manchego. I mm. want some manchego, right? Love it. I was eating some manchego. I was walking past and there was a bit of dark chocolate on the counter. I was, mm. <laughs> what happens? Absolutely. I had a piece of manchego, threw a piece of dark chocolate in. I was like, ah, this is good. <laughs> so, yeah. There you go. <laughs> I trust that all day. Yeah, no, my, my father's go to was fresh baked biscuits, a slice of cheddar cheese with syrup, like, like maple syrup. Like maple syrup? Top. Yeah. Cheddar cheese, biscuit, maple syrup. Yeah. I'm for that. He would go into that all that day. That sounds delicious. Actually, maple syrup, you hit the nail on the head. Maple syrup on bacon. Ooh, with this. Right, right here. Bacon. Yeah, I can identify that as the sweetness. So, Dahi, while we're, you know, still talking about whiskey, um, if you're good on time, if you're if you're not, we can uh, guys. I'm I'm enjoying the conversation. I, I'm getting to drink some high high octane whiskeys, <laughs> and my wife is like, "You're working. It's all good." You know, so. <laughs> so we actually we released an episode last week in terms of when the episode with you comes out, uh, but we we released an episode where we found for us uh, what we consider a personal unicorn, and that was Blue Spot. Ah, I haven't. I saw it on my. I was in my car and I saw a recent update. Yeah. I saw a unicorn. I didn't see what the rest was, and I haven't listened to it yet. Yeah. So we here. Here's what happened in that episode, and we just kind of want your take on it a little bit. Being, you know, obviously <laughs> someone in Ireland and and having an experience with more of the the Irish whiskey perspective. So in this episode, we were there. You go, blue spot. So I mean, it's really, really, whiskey shop behind me. <laughs> really difficult to procure bottle in our neck of the world. It truly is. Like it is almost impossible. How much will you pay me for it? <laughs> uh, What'd well, you pay? Uh, we'll start the bidding. We'll start the bidding. <laughs> How about I, I, got, I, I uh, saw it. Two hundred. Two hundred. Two hundred. I was gonna say I saw it in. That's really good. <laughs> I saw it in New York for two hundred. I could have wow. okay. bought it in really? New York for two hundred. Okay, I I found it for one hundred and twenty US, which yeah. is a pretty standard going price for that. And it's a brand new bottle. Look at that. <laughs> oh, well, let's open it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> where's yours? It's right there. <laughs> we need it. Go grab it. It's right there. <laughs> I haven't tasted this since a small sample I had in a bar one day when it came out. So here for all the people who. You know, buy bottles of whiskey and never open them. There you go. Yeah. Oh, that was, oh good. that was good. The first pop is always the best. It's always the best. Always the best. You can't repeat it. Did you already pour? Just poured. And uh, I'm just... mm. briefly, give us a, give us your take on Blue Spot. Just from from your perspective as a, a, a whiskey merchant, <laughs> as a, a whiskey connoisseur, as somebody uh, as somebody that I that I. I feel like has a, a better complete understanding of whiskey than 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 us. And I don't, is that a loaded question? Oh, I, w- I wouldn't say that. I have a different understanding. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'll, I'll take that. Well, like Blue Spot is, um, it's a single pot of Irish whiskey, okay? It's cash strength. It's a seven-year age statement. But I believe there might be older whiskey in there. Uh, but we don't know. Mm-hmm. Obviously, but it is originally Blue Spot was a was a Mitchell and Sons, which is a bonder in Ireland, which I am now today. Right, and they were bonders back in the day, and they used to they used to cover the barrels in their basement in Dublin, their warehouse, and they used to put paint marks on them for different styles and different age profiles. And so Blue Spot is the is one they brought back recently, but it's owned by Pernod Ricard now, so Mitchell and Sons don't own it anymore. Haven't for a long time, mm-hmm. even though they're on the label, etc. Right. So it's it's not a bonder brand anymore, really. Uh, if we're to be 
honest about it. Right. Uh, so that's one opinion I have on it. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the whiskey, I'm gonna I'm gonna try it with you now. But like pot still whiskey for those who maybe don't know is, and I think you guys did it. Did you do it? Um, oh, this is the one you did on. Sorry, I mm-hmm. haven't listened to it yet. So, so obviously you've explained that it's a mixed mash bill whiskey, uh, which is more similar to I guess to to bourbon style than than single malts. Right. Uh, but it's using malt of barley, non malt of barley. Now I don't know what the malt of barley, non malt of barley is in this one. They don't they don't disclose that information right what that gives you is it gives you a much more complex whiskey but it takes it takes longer for it to to mature i think mm-hmm. it needs more time um and it has a lot of spiciness in it which yeah. you'd be familiar with from bourbon and and rye whiskeys etc so right. i think there's a lot of a lot, i think that's why this style of whiskey can really once it starts to develop out of Ireland, it can really maybe challenge in the us to try and take market share and not try and convert people to single malt whiskey. Right. But say, hey, you know, you're drinking bourbon. Hey, check out pot still. Right. Especially high proof pot still, which you don't see a lot of. Right. right. More connections. Yeah. And and for and us, I, I mean, this that's is where like, I see the future of pot still whiskey. Yeah. For us, like this is nearly impossible to find. I mean, it, it truly when I when we put unicorn, like I, this is the only bottle I've ever seen. And I think you said yeah. you saw a I bottle. Think we, in we had had green spot. I mean, which you can find readily. We can, yeah. You can get Green Spot just about at any any liquor store here. Um, but we, I picked up a bottle of Yellow Spot maybe like a year ago, and we tried that, loved it. And so Blue Spot was like our next. All right, let's 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 go for the the big dog. But hadn't yeah, seen the it. Green Spot for me is the Leo Barton is the best. Yeah. Do you want a benchmark for pasta and Irish whiskey right now? That's the one. Yeah. So for me, what. Well, while we were discussing Blue Spot, we paired it with the only other high proof Irish whiskey we had at the time, which was the Red Breast Cast Strength. And in that episode, uh, we're, we're going back and forth between the two, and we have a realization that it might be the exact same stuff because they're both distilled at Middleton. They yeah. are both a Pernod Ricard uh, product. Uh, obviously, we don't know the mash bill, but we had this kind of revelation of where we just, I don't want to say tricked. Trick's not the right word. Tricked is not the right word. It was just it was just a realization of did we, are, are we sipping spirit that is so similar and we just didn't even consider that in the conversation mm-hmm. that we're drinking yes. distill it from the, the same is, place. Yes, it's the same distill. The damn it, I knew it. <laughs> And that was, you know, <laughs> if you if you listen to the episode, and, and and you know what, if I'm wrong, if anyone from Pernod Ricard is listening, uh, <laughs> maybe offer some uh, insight. That would be fantastic. But absolutely, nobody offers us any other insight. Other For sure, say that we, yeah, we changed the mash bill. So our our perception in Ireland is that these are the same distillate, which is nothing wrong with that, by the way. Right. And then it right. gets it gets you know it goes down a different journey, a different age statement. Right. Uh, different barrel types, different fattings, and you know it's really, it's fantastic stuff. Like so, oh, absolutely. You know, and these oh, were yeah. the things that we were. You know, I was a whiskey fan first and foremost, and I was always saying, you know, oh, you know, telling people you got to try Green Spot, Yellow Spot, uh, Blue Spot didn't exist at the time, Gold Spot didn't exist, Red Spot didn't exist. It was Yellow and Green, and Red Breast Cast Strength, and that's what I was telling people to drink and try and saying, these are really, really fantastic whiskeys and they'll give any single malt to run for their money. You know, that's what got me into passionate about whiskey. So I, I you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not giving Pernod Ricard a hard time, Irish distillers, because I'm really proud of what they, they've done and they kept this category alive. You know, without them, it, it, it was gone. Pots, pots of whiskey had disappeared in Ireland. Right. Bushmills never made it. And in the eighties, there was only, the early 80s there was only bush mills and there was only middleton right and that was it the industry was almost gone so they kept it going just about and red breast was for us like it was the pinnacle whiskey you know mm. we always looked upon it as when i was growing up and i was in the bar trade you know bought a red breast we always had a bottle of red breast in the house at home as well it got opened at christmas by my dad and stuff so i obviously wasn't allowed to drink it but it was like seen as a really special product right and it was because it was near it was nearly extinct like really and they kept it going and now that's what all the new people coming in like all of us people coming in are actually 
we are children of that generation who decided we love this product and we want to make it again right bring it back we want to support the category so for me pasta is is you haven't seen any pasta from me i have you've got one sample there but ultimately pasta is my where i want to get to right like i always do sing them i love singing about but i want to produce a pasta whiskey and show people how good it is and that's for me that's a passion project and it's taken time and i'm not rushing it right and i have a few as i said you have a few views on it and i think it really can be it really can be a big player and at the moment it's not it's tiny tiny market share of even irish whiskey and i think that that's part of our question or part of you know kind of why we brought this up is here in america you know a a distillery will do let's say 20 expressions you know and just for ease of idea like buffalo trace which is a huge name in in bourbon there's what 15 20 30 products that are coming out of buffalo trace at any given time and <laughs> that that we're allowed to know correct that, well that correct out, yeah. it's not that they're labeling it that way or necessarily marketing it that way it's done the same like this is made at the buffalo trace distillery so for us there was this like revelation of first of all wait these distillates are uh, this liquid is the same yeah if you go back and listen to the episode like it's very clear of like when that realization hit oh yeah of like, wait a second, this might be the same distillate. Yeah. Because it was so similar. Like one one is seven years, one is twelve years. The seven the blue spots a higher proof. The yeah. the red breast is a little bit lower. But they were so similar that we were just kind of like, oh, wait a second. Is this the same thing? And we yeah, obviously we turned around and we're uses, like, red breast uses Madeira and cherry and, yeah. and cherry as well. Right. So that we were just like, oh my god, mainly cherry, <laughs> mainly sherry, I think, from time to time, Madeira. So but, at that point, we we knew that we were going to be talking with you. So I think we both said like, we've we've got to ask, you know, Dahi, in terms of Irish whiskey as a whole, is is it similar in that way that you'll have a distillery like Middleton, which is Jameson, Pernod Ricard? Are they are they marketing things like similar to how bourbon is done here, where you'll yes, have multiple products? Answer. Okay. Go ahead. But the sorry, but the answer is is twofold because yes, it is for them, but there's a all the new distilleries. So Matt, there was two. I told you earlier, there was two in the early '80s. Then it was Cooley in the late '80s, three, and then West Cork four, Dingle five, Teeling six, and then ten years later, from Dingle, sorry, when it was five, you've got, which is 2023 now, forty plus distilleries. Right. right, that's epic. So. You know, give it another 10 years and you're going to have probably 50 plus distilleries and the variety of whiskey is going to be incredible because of pot still and because all of these new entrants are are being created. A lot of them are being really creative with pots of whiskey. Now, so I'm I'm a co-founder of the Irish Whiskey Guild, which is a, a an, indigo, an indigenous owner's uh owned Irish whiskey companies. So owned by families, small companies, and we're, we're a self-help group, but also we were lobbying to make some changes to the Irish whiskey technical file, which uh, reflects more of what we want to see to protect the category long-term and not what just happened in the last, you know, 50 years. Right. So we go back to what it was before that 50 year period and what it can be in the next 200 year period. And uh, we're trying to change it for that, not change it for like our generation, we'll change it for future generations back to where it used to be. And that means pots of whiskey at the moment is kind of railroaded into one very small envelope. And that's this style of whiskey, right? So that's, you can use basically 95% barley and then that barley must be malted barley, unmalted barley and 5% other grains. And those other grains can be any grains, right. okay? But most people are using malted barley, unmalted barley, maybe 60, 40, 50, 50, 70, 30, something like that, right? So you're going to get a lot of similar flavor profiles. Then you've got people adding oats and rye and wheat, which would have been the three main ones. And they're what historically people would have used, but we, we, they would have been used at much higher levels, like 20%, 30%. Uh, uh, so all of a sudden, it's a real mixed mash bill. Right. And this is what would have been brought to the US, by the way, and where bourbon would have come from. Right. Essentially, this pot still whiskey that was made in Ireland. So... Um, but they just used cereals that were available to them there as opposed to here. 
So that's how that kind of happened. But when you start doing that, you know, your flavor profile goes from, like you talked about it, I think, about rye on the last episode. Yeah. And you're going, yeah, 51% rye versus 95% rye. There's a there's huge a difference. difference. Yeah. Yeah. So pot still whiskey. Imagine pot still whiskey being 50 50 malted or 50 45 5. Right. And then you go 30 30 30 mm. or 30 40 30 or whatever it is. Right. Right. So you must use 30 of one or the other, which is what we're lobbying for right now. And we're working on that pretty hard. We had a submission with the Department of Agriculture and that's pretty exciting, actually, to be honest. And yeah. I kind of forget we're part, I'm part of that. And, you know, one of the founders of the, of the guild, and now we've got like 16 members and they're all small family businesses. But we, you know, the whole industry wide though, really wants this change. So is that for more continuity sake to define, this is what we mean by pot still Irish whiskey? We, we want it for historical reasons because what Posted Irish whiskey was the biggest selling whiskey in the world. Right. Single malt wasn't a thing. Right. Single malt became into existence in the 70s, right? Right. Because there was lakes of whiskey in Scotland and somebody decided it's a really clever marketing term and they were right. <laughs> no, but like that's sure, it's still great abs- whiskey. A- absolutely. Sure. That's what happened. Right. But pot still whiskey from Ireland, even the single means nothing. Single means distillery. Pot still whiskey in Ireland was the biggest whiskey in the world. By a by a country mile, right, right, and you know a lot of things happened: prohibition, wars of Britain, uh, trade wars after other wars, World War Two, all that happened, and uh, you know, arrogance, arrogance happened too, and all of a sudden they went from being you know top of the heap to being getting the shit kicked out of them. So, <laughs> so like. We're trying to bring it back to that because when you start tasting these these flavor profile whiskeys, like these pot stills and oats are in there. Yeah. Um, it's incredible. Yeah. Like, trust me, it's gonna be a hell of a journey when yeah. you when you get to taste them because and that's what we want. We want people to experience that. I mean, you know, we don't need more single malt or more of the same, you know, one profile whiskey. Like right. we don't need that. We need variety. Yeah. Right. And you can still control that variety. And, and also the other thing is you can set up a distillery in the U S right now and you can start making pot still whiskey and you can do what you like with it. And we can't do anything about that. So we can't then compete in our own category. Interesting. Yeah. If that happens. And that's unfair. Right. Uh, and small producers also need that. We need this to be able to, and small distilleries need this to be able to differentiate ourselves from mass produced product. Right. Um, so it's sorry. It's a it's a bit of a it's a whole other topic of conversation. No, to be honest. but sure. I, I think it's a huge I mean, historical side to it. And exactly, and like when you come over, I'll I'll show you some. I, I have some new makes from all different mash bills here. I'll bring them to you and historical ones. And, That's cool. Well, and and I think like your point is, it's not this, you know, this larger like we just want to protect because it's it's a you know money making endeavor. It's yeah. It's we want to do this because this is. I dare I say Ireland in the glass. This is Irish whiskey. It's like this heritage. Is exactly. Yeah. It's ours. Like, exactly. It, look, if it was cognac, if it was yeah, Bordeaux, you, you Burgundy, wouldn't fight for it. Yeah. Champagne. Like, champagne. Why, exactly. Why, why should we treat it any less? Yeah. If it was bourbon. Tequila. Look how bourbon is. Exactly. Indeed. Yeah. Exactly. And and that to me, like grab, it's we're trying to protect this thing to protect the longevity of it, to protect the product as a whole, and to say, you know. Uh, there's a there are great sparkling wines, there are terrible champagnes, but to say this is a champagne, this is what we're trying to to achieve, right? You know, there's some precedence there. There's there, there's this is what this thing is, right. and I think that based on what I'm hearing anyway, that's what you're trying to achieve in that in that respect. Absolutely, nailed it. Yeah, it's it's, it's just really exciting. So yeah, it's a, yeah. and as I said, it's a whole other discussion, and there are, there are people out there who are distilling. And are far more passionate than I am. Um, well, maybe not far more passionate, but they have a lot more to lose if it doesn't work as well. This change, you know. So at this point in time, I, I feel like it's hard to see how it it doesn't make the category better. Like I, I think that's what you know. Since I've been interested in whiskey, is like let's see how how can each category expand. And at this point in time, like it's easy to see how Scotch has expanded. Like there's so many varieties, and it has such a depth of a of a field of what it can be that it's time to see. Like, all right, what can 
bourbon expand out into? What can, I guess, American whiskey? What can Irish? It's it's so interesting to see where everything can go from this point. Yeah. That it's like a really exciting time to be interested in the spirit. Yeah. And that same token, like, I feel that that's kind of to some degree what limits bourbon in a way it's of too defined exactly there's this like here's what bourbon must be so then with that kind of definition to some degree it's like if you start aging with different you know uh casks or then you can't call it bourbon anymore now it has to be a whiskey and the american consumer is as much as obviously you know we're u.s based the american consumer when they see something like whiskey versus bourbon they're like oh it's not bourbon but it's like that's a term like yes it is a specific thing but try this whiskey from a bourbon distiller but they can't call it bourbon because it's i, I don't know oloroso sherry vat i don't know what, what that means yeah what and, and that i think is part of just education yeah you know and that's i think something that we strive to do is Hey, try things outside of, of your general purview. You know, sure, it doesn't have a turkey on the front, or it doesn't have <laughs> the word Jack and Daniels on the front. Right. Try something. Try and who knows? You might be pleasantly surprised. You might be like, nope, that's sad trash. Yeah. But you want you know, to don't try, try a JD, try a WD. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, Stamp you, of approval. You've been sitting on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's just it. and I think that that's the three of us that that's part of what we do is as maybe I'm giving us too much credit ambassadors of whiskey in some way it's not it's not just like listen you know we all incur marketing but here's what is actually going on try this think about this you know you say you don't drink triple distilled Irish or triple distilled whiskey excuse me you say you don't drink triple distilled whiskey, but the very whiskey that you said you like is a triple distilled whiskey. Oh, they just, they, they're not going to say that or they, you know, for whatever reason, they're not going to put that on a label, but that's what these things are, right. you know? And, and yeah, for, not all Irish whiskey is triple distilled and it, you know, the majority exactly. of new distilleries are probably double distilled as much as triple distilling. Um, that's just how it is. Like that, that from clear to hear you had that's double distilled. And for bourbon, it's, it's like the, uh, uh, you know, is it, is it charcoal mellowed or not? There are things that are that they'll tell you. There are things that aren't that you know won't. It, it's it's all about what are they willing to disclose too. So for you to say, well, I don't like this product, okay, but how much do you know about that product? Yeah, you shouldn't you shouldn't you shouldn't just say I don't like a category, right? Like right. that's like saying like I don't like you know you don't like a, a particular brand of champagne. I don't like champagne. It's like well, you know, or I don't like Scotch or I don't like Irish. Well, you just haven't drank probably enough of it if you're making that statement right i'm sure you'll find something you like yeah it's a challenge for sure but it's uh but i think that's going back to what we're talking with the pot still, i think that's what we want to do is we want to be able to sh give people such variety of a style of whiskey that's quintessentially the irish style of whiskey we can all see them all can be made anywhere but this is something that we we invented it is ours right no one else can lay claim to that so you can have all the arguments you want over who invented whiskey you know we did you know it doesn't matter. Right. The Scotch can talk about it, but we actually did. But pot still, we 100% own that. Yeah. That's ours. Right. And that's what we should be trying to celebrate and, and grow. You know, we don't we don't need more of the same. The world doesn't need more of the same. Let's let's break out of that. Let's let's try something different. Yeah, there's room for us all. There's room for bourbon. There's room for pot still Irish whiskey. And there's room for single malt whiskeys from anywhere in the world, not just Scotland. So <laughs> we can make those too. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. So, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I look, if you go through my shaft there, I got so much Scotch bourbon, I got Japanese, German, Italian. You know, I try, you got to be open to trying things. You know, if you're a whiskey fan, be a whiskey fan. Right. Don't be like, I'm, I'm a brand fan. And that's right. it. Yeah. Right. You got anything else? No, like such a pleasure, Dahi. Absolutely cannot express that enough. What you've sent us, it's amazing. It's always a pleasure to chat with you and just absorb your whiskey knowledge is amazing. <laughs> Hearing your stories is such an, an awesome thing. Yeah, it truly is. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, thank you. It's very kind of you. And I, 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 uh, I, uh, I must say, I love getting on it. And it's, 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 it's just fun having a chat with, you know, 
I think we're, we haven't met in person, but I think we're friends, you know, so. Absolutely. I yeah. agree completely. I think we, we can, if, we, if you can talk for this long, this comfortable, we're even your friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I was looking now at the recorder. I'm like, we've been talking for over two hours. Like, I feel like we literally just, just got on. started. Yeah. Yeah, we could we could go for a while longer, but I better I better show a face downstairs. I should be away for two days. <laughs> Thanks so much. Love yeah, it. Yeah. And Absolutely. I look forward to doing more uh chats with you guys. And 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 you know, when you have those whiskeys, if it's night, whatever, just well, I'd love to hear your opinions on them. Yeah. Dahi, thank you so much and uh have a good night. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Have a good one, guys. Pleasure. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Well, you can get in touch with us through email. It's dreppingstone at gmail.com. You can also get in touch with us through social media. It's always one word, dreppingstone, D-R-E-P, and stone. Come and find us, like us, share some comments. You know, we're all in this together. For sure. And you can support Dreppingstone through our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash dreppingstone. We've got a lot of awesome things going on there. Lots of good videos there. T- tell the people, what, what what are we doing? We've got uh, a little series that we do called uh, Just a Thought, uh, where we just kind of share thoughts together. We reply to those occasionally. Yeah, we respond to them. Uh, we do uh, Just a Pour. Ooh with either drip or stone yeah. sometimes and stone occasionally when we can get that working lots of good stuff on there yeah good episode notes and some pics yeah tonight's pour yeah you know it just it helps us all stay connected and you know build driving that, home that society of yeah. uh, togetherness that, that we're trying community. to do 100 yeah. percent. i like that that's good <laughs> you can also support drop and stone by rating this podcast wherever it is you find great podcasts like this podcast absolutely yeah. where, where can you stick that thumb up be sure you do it <laughs> Find a, find a place and put it there. <laughs> and you finally can support the podcast by telling someone about Drep and Stone. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Tell a friend, share, share a post, however you can kind of connect us. You know, we'd really appreciate it. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. May your glass overflow. And your ass never show. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. So you just found out. Just found out yesterday. That, I mean, honestly, that's really fucking cool. Like, that's awesome. Yeah, is my mic okay for you guys? Yeah. Loud enough here? Oh, yeah, I think so. Can you just say a couple things real quick? A couple of things real quick. That works. That way, and it's a scotch, I guess. Sure. Uh, obviously, you know that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you know Scotland is next to us? So, and, is, it, is it separated uh, by, uh, let, what is that? Uh, let the me ocean. Is an ocean. you. Uh, and... <laughs> Um, is that possible? I, don't know, maybe. I should get rid of my emails off the screen, maybe. Unless it's sensitive information. It's always sensitive. It's it's FBI level stuff. <laughs> I can tell you, Netflix has been hit hard right now. <laughs> <laughs> You'll know. Oh no! Did it again? Damn! It's it's when I get too boring. You go off. Oh, <laughs> no chance. We're just gonna we're just gonna shut them off and reset. <laughs> Sorry. My house is so big. I was in the West Wing. <laughs> I understand. That wing. Like, I'm sad that this bottle is empty and that it's going to be near impossible to get another one. I have a penchant for those things, I guess. Oh, no, I only drink single malt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, or, uh, come on. one of the ones I heard one time was, oh, no, I don't drink triple distilled whiskey. Okay. I was like, oh, really? Yeah. How many of you tried? And they're like, <laughs> Akintoshin. <laughs> and you're like, oh yeah, so it's not even the same country. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that's so, cool. I'll see what it can bring over. I don't know how that works. What are the laws? Who knows? I'll look into it. It's Ireland. You go, yeah. oh, be grand. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, nobody will check your bag. Don't worry. No. Stop. No. No way. No. Yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah. just be honest. Uh, how do Bushmans make this stuff and not sell it? <laughs> right. <laughs> Honestly. Dahi, do you, do you like Guardians of the Galaxy? I love it. Has has it? It hasn't opened over there yet, has it? No. You're gonna love it. <laughs> I like. It. Yeah. That's not funny. That's, yeah. that's, that's not fair. It's absolutely great. Good. <laughs> yeah. They absolutely nailed it. Did they? Yeah. I love that guy. He's a crazy guy. But like, 
Th- not this, director. This movie, but, this movie was the first one to me that felt like a pre-Endgame Marvel universe. Ooh. Everything since... Ooh, that's big. That's a big I know, claim. I know. Everything since Endgame I'll, to me I'll is hold felt... hold you accountable. Yeah, do it. Because this was the first one that I was like, th- this feels right. This feels like old Marvel. NFL footballer turmoil. Yeah, exactly <laughs> that. Exactly that, that kind, kind of level. That right, right there, right in. Yeah. Okay, then. interesting. So it's gonna be interesting to see how they how they work that one out. I just, that's great that that's the point of reference. Yeah, no, that's like that's uh, that's exactly perfect. where it yeah, is. That's exactly. Well, wow. that's, a, that's a category of criminal right there in itself. <laughs> right, you know? right. And okay. that's for anyone who's listening. <laughs> no. <laughs> I will definitely be take sure that to out. include that in the intro. Yeah, that that'll be in the intro. That'll right be off the, the bat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you, you should just go. It's three five three, and then the last digits just change the last digit nine eight. <laughs> some guy yeah. is is that Dahi? <laughs> no, who the fuck keeps asking for Dahi? <laughs> Perfect, nailed it. That'll work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>